First question, how many of you were alive in 1972? <laughs> Holy cow, all the whole front row. The guy with the beard, though, didn't raise his hand. In 1972, I, well, before I do that, I grew up and I was always playing games, board games. Uh, I learned about D&D &D in the early 70s, very early 70s, and my kids would play it. Then something very interesting happened. The way the world plays games changed in 1972 with this little ball, this little spot on the screen that went back and forth, back and forth. You will play us. You will put a quarter in the machine. And I'm pretty sure, I'm not sure, but there was probably subliminal information going across the screen. Uh, Atari was formed. I worked for Atari for uh, three and a half, almost four years. I saw it go from 8,000 people to 150 people in a year and a half. And that was because the... Not on my watch. No, no it, wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't Nolan's fault. It was uh, Warner. And it was sad because I thought that I would never ever find another company like the company that Nolan started until 2006 when I came to work here. So with that, the man who changed the way all of us probably play games, Nolan Bushnell. Thank you. <laughs> You know, this is, this is my week for immersion in Googleness. Um, I was in Phoenix at the Zeitgeist and just met more really interesting, dynamic, fun people. And, uh, and it just continues on, so it just gets better and better. And, and you guys are really in a great space where creativity is truly appreciated and nurtured. And, a way that is somewhat unique, much more unique than it ever should be. But let's, uh, let's say that we are the chosen. Creativity really drives what our world is. And create, the, the first spawn of creativity is actually optimism. Is that glass half full or half empty? What's that? <laughs> We know, we actually believe that we can train for optimism and that one of the, the objectives of today's school system is to train optimism out of you. And I hope to fix that. Everybody who's ever had a shower has had a good idea. <laughs> Do you own that idea? No. Is it your idea? No. You don't own an idea until you work on it, until you fine tune it, until you research it. Anybody who says, he stole my idea, is a fool. If you had an idea and you didn't do anything on it, you're lazy. Laziness is unacceptable. And so if somebody did your idea, did their idea, even if you told them about your idea, and they did something that you didn't, not shame on them, shame on you. Get that in your head, and it'll change your life. Success does not follow ideas. Success follows hard work. And you can find that the, the difference between the people who took a risk and worked their butt off and the people who sort of had an idea, filed a patent, thought they were going to depend on it, doesn't happen. Do you want me to tell you about the patent laws? Patents. Or let's say you get a patent. Well, what happens is that's a great big 40 millimeter howitzer. And you can walk around, you can point it at people. But the person who you're pointing it at looks at you, looks at the howitzer, and they know 
that in order to successfully prosecute a patent suit right now probably costs you between a half a million and a million dollars. And they say, do you have a half a million, does that guy have a half a million dollars? The answer generally comes back, no. And so they say, it's not loaded. <laughs> so Atari had massive numbers of patents. Zero patent fights. We got sued, we'd settle or not, or fight them. But with our patent portfolio, we never sued anybody. Sound like a company you know? Yeah. Google's, to my knowledge, has never sued anybody on their massive patent portfolio. Why did they, why did you buy Motorola? patent portfolio, I think it's defensive. Basically, you just want to be able to, sh if, if Apple gets cute, shut the bastards down, you know? I mean, that's a, that's, a, that's a reasonable thing, but I think it's a defensive strategy, not an offensive one. Just my guess. Flow. There's a, a guy with an absolutely unpronounceable name, <laughs> who has written a book and who I believe has created some understanding that is really profound, and it's called the state of flow. I've spent my life working to put people into the state of flow, and what is it? Flow is massively addictive. It's as happy as you will ever be. And what are the characteristics? It means that it's right at the edge of your capability. It's not too hard, it's not too easy. And what happens as you get into challenges and skills, if you can just keep in this section you have massive addiction, and you can make video games that make a lot of money. So all my life, I've been wending this way to figure out how do you keep people addicted? And the, the answer is, we figured out very early on that video games, they're only lost about 25 to 30% of the players from one level to another was somewhat of an, an optimum level of flow. Wasn't too hard, wasn't too easy. Right there. Turns out that if you can get kids learning at that state of flow, retention triples, the day flies by, and we believe that we can teach kids at 10 times the current speed at which they're being taught in today's public education, private education, parochial education, and maybe as much as 20 times faster. Giving the ability to do a full four years of high school in less than a year. But I'll talk more about that later. This is a principle of which I've lived my life. I think that uh, I have made and lost more money <laughs> than anybody has the right to do. And it has been a ball. <laughs> now, now stop to think about it. If you're a true existentialist, which I consider myself to be, what you really want to be able to do is have an interesting life. And having a lot of money is really cool. And, you know, I had my 15,000 square foot house in Woodside on 15 acres with horses and tennis courts and swimming pools. And, and I bought it when I was single, so I had hot and cold running girls. Uh, Life was good. Um, but at the same time, 
I later on got married, filled it full of kids. I've got eight kids. And uh, one of the, the lessons that I would like to encourage you is you guys all should go out tonight and procreate. <laughs> it's not only fun, but it's good for the world. And the reason for that is there's a kind of reverse Darwinianism going on right now in which the stupid people are reproducing and the smart ones aren't, and that's wrong. It will probably sow the seeds for a worse future than global warming, pestilence, famine, war, than anything else, because intelligence is the only thing that allows man to survive and prosper. It's our, it's, it's, it's our secret sauce. And if we allow our gene pool through attrition or good intentions to deteriorate, shame on you. I've got eight kids, done my part. <laughs> now, let's talk a little bit about the history. This is kind of fun. For me, it started as a summer job. I was making a lot of money selling advertising. But I did the thing called the campus splatter, and I sold advertising around a, uh, a calendar events, gave it away at the beginning of the quarter in college. And I was making about $5,000 per calendar. I did that on, in five campuses two or three times a year, whether it was based on semesters or things. I was driving a 190 SL, putting myself through college, having a great life. But no matter how much money I made, I found I could spend more. <laughs> so in order to sort of take myself out of harm's way, I got a minimum wage job at the local amusement park. Couldn't do anything on my advertising company during the day. Clocked in at four, clocked out at midnight on the weekdays, two o'clock on the weekends. And it was summer, it was in Utah, I was having a great time. And uh, there were always girls there. I was 19 years old. And uh, what I learned was a lot about how you entice people to play a game for a quarter. Whether it was throwing balls at milk bottles, whether it was throwing basketballs, what have you. There's a lot of psychology. And it turns out that I was pretty good at it, and they asked me to be manager the following year. And so all of a sudden I had P&L responsibility for a $3 million operation in a three month period during the summer, had 150 kids working for me, and that was my real MBA. But it also really immersed me in entertainment in a very, very powerful way. Because the arcades report, reported to me. This is what a geek looked like in 1963. This is a single flip-flop. OK? It is really, oh yeah, flip-flop has moved, hasn't it? Hey, bi-stable multi-vibrator, OK? <laughs> isn't that, that's a flip-flop, isn't it? Bi-stable, multi, yeah. Anyway, um, but, this was what a graphics card looked like in 1962. And this was Dr. Evans of De Evans and Sutherland, who basically did a tremendous amount of pioneering research on graphics. This is a PDP-1. And the unique thing about it was this puppy. This is an old radar display, XY, and a guy named uh, Russell, with his MIT buddies, programmed a game called Space War. 
And I played this game, was mesmerized, hooked, entranced, captivated. And I saw an opportunity to, that if I could put these games in my arcades at the amusement park, I'd make a shit pile full of money. It was not to be, yet. I programmed some games in 1966 on this platform, but if you applied a 25 cents into a $2 million computer, the math didn't work. <laughs> so, I went forward. This is Willie Higginbotham. This is actually the very first video game. Brookhaven National Labs, 1958. It was a combination of resistors, capacitors, transistors, but mainly relays. This is a relay video game. But it was played on an oscilloscope, and this is pretty much the first video game. It's called Tennis for Two. And then this is Steve Russell, the PDP-1. This is what the game looked like. And then there was this thing called a computer quiz. Now, computer quiz was done by nutting, and you think, that looks sort of like it might be a video game. It wasn't. Turns out there was a slide projector in there. <laughs> but it was, a, it was the first trivia game, did really, really well. And then we did computer space. Computer space was actually before Pong, but it was too hard. All my friends loved it, all my friends were engineers. <laughs> um, and it used Newton's second law, you know, it, it maintained various things, you know, it would rotate, it, it would wrap around, nobody knew what wrap around was. Remember, nobody had experience with wrap around. It's, a, it's an artifact of video games, and this is the first puppy. Um, the girl in the, uh, in the brochure was a topless dancer, the brass rail just down the street. Um, the marketing manager, I think, had a thing with her, but I'm not sure. Anyway, we did our test at the Dutch Goose, you know, over by Stanford. Did well. A lot of Stanford kids. False positive. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, you know, it was one of those things that uh, you put it in a beer bar, nobody home. They just couldn't figure out what to do with it. And so um, we, uh, and, and when, when I say it was a failure, we did about $3 million in sales on it. And, uh, and I thought that the guys that were running Nutting um, were pretty lame. Do you know what the wonderful thing about entrepreneurship is? Everybody has set in, that, you know, in the valley here. We have had an office mate or a friend who we know were smarter than that have gone off and started their own company and made a million dollars. And you say to yourself, He's not that smart. Well, that was the way nutting was. They were so inept that I thought, there is no possible way that if I start my own company that I was, I'll be able to screw it up as badly as they did. Anyway, so I started to talk. This was a license. I licensed this to nutting, and they built it. And so the next one came along, and I got a contract See, my first idea was to be a contract design house, because I had no factory, I had no manufacturing, nothing. And so I was going to sell it to the big guys. So I got a contract with Bally, who was the big pinball video game guy at the time. Oh, this is an early picture. The polka dot shirt didn't catch on. <laughs> uh, but, uh, this was our Pong game. And we went away from the, the fiberglass cabinet because it was too slow and too expensive. And, uh, and this was the Pong game. And Al Alcorn, this guy, was actually the guy that programmed it up. UC Berkeley, he was my technician at Ampex. 
and a really, really smart guy, and Pong was actually a training program for him. You know, I'd, I'd seen the game and uh, put him up to it, and it's one of those crazy things. No matter how many interviews that I would give and say, Al Alcorn designed the game, did that, everybody said, Nolan Bushnell invented Pong. It used to really piss him off. But I, I tried not, so I'm saying out loud and forever, Al Alcorn designed Pong. Huh? It won't matter. Uh, <laughs> Magnavox Odyssey was a consumer game that came along. Um, and then we did this one later on. And we took this to the toy show, probably the most successful video game well, it was up to that point, Consumer Pong. We took to the toy show and we sold zero. You say, what? Well, my friends liked it, my neighbors wanted one. How could the stores not? Well, we found out that they, first of all, they had, had not had a great experience with the Odyssey returns because the coin op game was really, really fun and Odyssey was less fun. And a lot of people thought that they were buying the coin-op pong when they bought the Odyssey, so they had returns. And returns in retail is just like a toxic plague. And so we didn't do that well uh, at, at selling it in. And then one day, my sales guy got a call from Sears, or he made the call, and they, he said what we had, and it turned out that he that the Sears had had a pinball machine the year before, a consumer pinball machine, that had sold out. And we said, oh, pinballs are in bars, pongs in bars. Yeah, let's give it a try. So he shows up, flew from Chicago the next morning, and uh, we, go, we go in and he says, how many you can build? I had no idea. So I said, let me check on that and talk to my manufacturing guy. And he says, I think between now and Christmas, we could build maybe 25,000. So I went back into him and I said, 75,000. <laughs> and because uh, I didn't want to necessarily be sole source. But then he says, great, I'll give you an order for 150,000. <laughs> And so all of a sudden, we had an order for 150,000. We had a perceived capacity to manufacture 25,000. Scratch my head. And so he left, and we put our thinking caps on. And it's really amazing what happens when all of a sudden you have a goal, aspirations, with a lot of money attached. And we figured out that we could maybe build as many as 200,000, with the exception of one thing. There was no way to finance it. We, we just didn't have enough money. Atari never had any money. Because um, we were always outgrowing our capital structure. And video games at that time were perceived to be trivial and silly and, and you know, why would you invest in a video game when you could buy a steel company or, or God forbid, wheat? I don't know. Uh, and so it was really a problem. And so I called up Sears and I said, can't, can't do it. We, uh, we don't have enough money. And he said, oh, don't worry about it. I'll introduce you to Sears Bank. And they set up a credit facility that every time a pong dropped off the end of the production line, they'd advance us 80%. Boom. Solved. And all of a sudden, we were in the big time. And whoa, was it fun. <laughs> anyway, then we did the VCS and just did a whole bunch of good stuff. Of course, Warner really screwed things up. What they didn't realize, see, Warner had a big record company at the time. And uh, they thought the video game business was about software. It is about software. But they felt that the 2600 
would last forever. And as you know, the 2600 was actually a piece of crap. <laughs> it was hard to program. I mean, you don't have quarter inch pixels because you think it's cool. <laughs> but, you know, but it was, it was one of those things that you could do for a price at the time. And by the time we actually hit the market, the, the price, you know, do you have any bytes of memory the 2600 had? Anybody? 256. 256. Not K, <laughs> 256 <laughs> bytes. Which is a very interesting question when you say, how did we play chess on the 2600 with that much memory? Because you have 64 squares, they need to be indicated somehow, 32 pieces that are different. <laughs> Tricky. Anyway, but we had a chess game that actually had some pretty good AI, but I was proud of that. Anyway, um, went forward, we did Quack and a whole bunch of other fun stuff. This game, Touch Me, was actually the game that you know as Simon. Now Simon was done by a guy named Ralph Bear who did Odyssey and licensed to Mattel or uh, to Hasbro and they made a lot of money and it came right out of our lab and it's one that got away. Shame on me. It was my idea my product, and somebody else made more money on it than I did. Those things, you just got to be able to get over, which I clearly have not. What a lot of people don't realize is that everybody in the world copied Pong. Our patents hadn't been done yet, and there was TV tennis, winner, what have you, and so 15,000 was a good number, but compared to 160,000 ping pong-like games, and a lot of them, they just Xeroxed our circuit board, and they were in the business. I always like to say, the good news was that Pong could be made in a garage shop because that's all we had. Bad news, a lot of people that had garage shops that could do it as well. So, win some, lose some. I talked a little bit about Chuck E. Cheese, um, built it up to about 250, sold it to Brock Hotel, did Anderbot. This was, this was my swan song. Remember how I told you about losing money? Wow. Um, this was really a product that I, I fell in love with. Could not solve a technical problem. The market was there, we were doing, you know, we had big orders. I actually faked a trade show presentation. Shouldn't do that. Um, but what happened is the, the robots had no noise immunity. The, piece, the, the, the computers at those times had very, very, you know, high threshold impedance, and so any kind of spark or what have you would create false stuff. And basically, you're, you're, the computer would crash. Well, if a computer crashes in a robot, it ain't like the, the blue screen of death. It becomes actual death. And that's because all your systems shut down, all your fail-safe stuff goes on, and it can be sometimes in an indeterminate state. You can do some other stuff, but basically you can end up with a 45, 50 pound robot going full speed in some random direction. <laughs> Stairways, mean vases, babies, you know. We used to call it the, the mow the baby mode. And, uh, <laughs> which is not really, really a good place to be. Anyway, we tried isolation, Gaussian enclosures, all kinds of stuff. 
but ran out of money, put 26 million of cash, my own cash, into that little guy. And uh, I keep one of these in my office as a reminder to not fall in love with small little things that are cute. <laughs> I did the first automobile navigation company um, called ETAC. It was right around here. We basically mapped the world. To give you an idea, we were using um, digital equipment, 750s. You could fry eggs on the things. Uh, but we would map aerial reconnaissance with uh, Census Bureau dime files. We sold the company to News Corp, made a fortune. In fact, I believe that my database is still at, at the core of Google Maps right now. So it's, uh, it went from there to Sony to, uh, to uh, another company. Ah, oh, well, I can't forget. But so I had the original patents on all automobile navigation. This was 1983, so they'd gone through. My video, this, this was the earliest shopping thing that we did. We, I was just too early. The, the internet should have, I mean, I really loved the, the internet, but this was the first shopping terminal. The data was on a laser disc, believe it or not. And it was in airports and what have you. Swipe your credit card, 300 baud modem, would blindingly fast send the, the order down. Um, worked. We ended up selling it to McKesson. It was a good business, but uh, it wasn't as gr it, it really was, was Amazon, but 10 years too soon. Did a toy company. Uh, notice the little dog. That was uh, just about ready to go in, and I sold the company to Hasbro. Did Magnum Microwave. This was about hopping. Networks, networks were coming along and hopping them over streets. Did a thing called a restaurant. This was sort of an attempt to be a chain of restaurants for um, like Chuck E. Cheese, but for more adults and family oriented. I actually had one in, uh, in uh, Mountain View on Castro Street that was open about a femtosecond. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and it turned out that uh, Right after the, the initial you know, wheels came off the economy, everybody that was selling an $8 burger went out of business, and all the people that, had, that were selling $4 burgers did OK. And so we uh, basically pulled in our horns. We now have units going up in China and selling the software into Burger King and various things. But running the restaurants ourselves, we decided that we were going to lick our wounds and not do it anymore. This is how you ordered your food. Interesting, we started out just with food, drinks, and, and, uh, and media. And parents really objected to have their kids push on drinks in order to get, get a Coke. So we had to add that in. Uh, who knew? Um, let's see. These are the kind of games that we had, hugely fun, group games. Place was covered with big screens. Of course, you could have an icy beverage. Um, one of the things that I'm concerned about is, is that uh, today with gyroscopes and, uh, and GPS, you can know where you are. But inside, like in a gap or something like that, I'm actually into a different section. I'm, I'm giving up on all the stuff that I've worked on. Um, and we, I think that the next big wave is how can I get plus or minus 20 centimeters with my cell phone inside a place? Because then you can do all kinds of fun stuff. Like, I really like this. <laughs> if I can walk down. If I can walk down the street 
with this kind of a view, you know, superimposed based on my, my cell phone on my overhead projector, I think that my life would be a lot better or worse. <laughs> I've got a, um, a, a, a new kind of video game that I've been working on. This is where you have a whole bunch of fun stuff where you basically go from adventure to adventure and uh, 45 minutes later you've saved the world, uh, which is really a good thing. I'm really big on bio implants right now. I've got some investment in there. I mean, the whole idea of doing all this stuff, my education is working on how do I recognize cognition. Turns out that there's some brain inputs of when, not when you actually understand something, but when you think you do. And so you can do some interesting pacing and fixing on that. This is a very stylish headgear. Um, I really like public space games. Uh, this is one that we designed. It's down in Mindshare. Um, virtual reality in terms of, or alternative reality. Did you know that these evil monkeys are inhabiting this space right now? And that you have to go into your cell phone to see the world that they inhabit and defeat them? I don't know if how many, how many of you have been to Burning Man? You like it? I love it a lot. Well, you've probably seen these kinds of things. This is something in Germany. These sculptures interact with you. And it really changes the environment of any of these spaces where these interactive light things are. And, and I really believe that they increase the quality of life. The new Woodstock. This is uh, in Bilbao, Spain. Uh, 40,000 people geeking out. They take a big convention center. Part of them are tents. They come for a week. One wall has uh, uh, nothing but microwave ovens. People basically game until they drop, climb into their habitats for a few moments of sleep and they're back at it. It's a, uh, this is really the new Woodstock and I believe this is a growing trend. Should figure out a way to market to it. A lot of people don't realize how much risk and creativity are linked. When you drop risk, creativity can really skyrocket. As risk increases, creativity drops. It's really hard to innovate on a pacemaker. You can do it, but it's a very, very difficult thing. The software tools that are happening right now and the, cheap, the, the drop in price of laser cutters and laser printers and various things like that is getting really astounding. And I think that we are on this road to very, very explosive creativity and invention. I mean, I think this is going to, the next 10 years are going to be the golden age of innovation and technical progress. And it's because the tools and the costs and everything is just really climbing into it. What a lot of people don't realize is that there's a huge opportunity of mixing ideas. Go to a trade show that you haven't been to before. Like, have anybody ever been to a grocery store trade show? Or a, a, uh, a carpet trade show? I make it a point to, if I'm in Las Vegas, for whatever reason, I will go and attend a random trade show. And believe it or not, it's really fun because a trade show is like a snapshot of an industry. Every once in a while you end up in the middle of a bunch of really weird people, which uh, is a judgment call on my part. <laughs> but at the same time, 
I, I don't have a lot of rem resonance with taxidermy, though I'm sure it's really a nice thing. Uh, but stuff like that. Um, but I really recommend random trade shows, and you will come out with 10 entrepreneurial ideas. I mistrust consensus. Uh, because in general, most stupid people really like to agree with a majority. And so when consensus starts to build, in general, it tends to be with people who, have, who are knee-jerking the concept. And so you've you got to really look at the, at the provenance of the consensus, because so many times consensual thinking is, or consensus thinking is, is wrong. Oh, I already said that. Got to tell you an interesting story about creativity. This was done at um, Columbia University. A psychology professor went into the, uh, the class on pottery making. And they said, we're going to try something in grading that's different. Everybody on the left side is going to be judged based on pounds of pots. They all have to be pots, but the more pots you make, the higher your score, your grade. Left side, you're going to be judged on one pot, so it better be good. But you only have to do one, but it has to be really creative and cool. At the end of the quarter, all of the best pots came from the quantity side. And what does that tell you? What they'd inadvertently done is drop the barrier on the left side. And as a result, creativity could reign unfettered. And plus, they were doing a lot of pots, so they got some pretty good technical skills by pushing things. If you're not falling down, you're not learning how to ski. And so I just like to point that out that sometimes just doing really a lot of stuff will give you inspiration into doing stuff really well. If you don't know what this is, this is a 3D printer. And it basically takes a filament of plastic, melts it, and puts it on a 3D model according to some software. Think of it as, a, as, a, as an XY printer. But these things are about 600 bucks. But the thing that's neat about it is once you have one, it can make the parts, about 80% about of the parts for the next one. And so it's very close to a machine, replicating a machine, replicating a machine. So the, the two mirrors across the hall are almost aligned. Watch this movement. It's going to be huge. Trying to say, you know, when you're dealing with other people's ideas, try to say yes. It's very easy to say no because it's a stupid answer. There's no risk. And it's a lazy answer. And one of the things that we tried to do at Atari, and I think Google does too, is ask for data, ask for analytics, and no one can have an unresearched no. If you say no, you have to say what you would do instead. And what that does, that gets rid of the lazy no's. You just say, oh, OK. You don't agree with this project. What do you think we should do instead? And, uh, and it makes for a much better corporate culture. OK, the future. Read science fiction. I believe that science fiction is so cool. Anybody here read Hyperion? Great 
Isn't that great stuff? Neil Stevenson, great stuff. Uh, I just read a thing called um, uh, Player One, Return Player One. It's all about video games in the 80s. God, I loved it. It was really <laughs> Ready Player One. What? Ready Player One. Ready player one. So fun. Um, anyway, these are kind of some random thoughts. Notice auto drive cars there. Boy, do I love that one. <laughs> well, have you ever stopped to think about all the secondary ramifications of auto drive cars? Lower gas, uh, you know, better gas mileage. Because once you're driving nose to tail, first car drafts the rest of that. Increases the lanes a little bit. I'm just thinking about how bad the routing is. What? I'm just thinking about how bad the routing is. Um, not, I think you can get there, pretty much. And, and if you change the design of the, the, of the unit, you should be able to get almost perfect drafting, and all of a sudden your typical gas mileage can drop, can, can go to over 70 miles an hour, because almost all, everything over 60 miles, or 40 miles an hour is windage. The other thing, think about a packet network. Your car has an 18 inch 18 inch or half meter by half meter uh, container that's in the lower left hand side of your car or right hand side. There are little kiosks on each corner. And so what happens is when you, when your car, if you sign up to being part of the packet network, you can load any kind of an object, a pizza, a package, UPS, into your car, into your container. If you're going to turn right and the package wants to go left, it deposits it in the kiosk and waits for somebody to come along who's turning left. And you should be able to get a package from anywhere to anywhere. And the math turns out to be about 1.2 to 1.3 times what a direct path if you were driving right to your home depending on the traffic density and a few other things. So all of a sudden, you have a delivery mechanism, a packet delivery mechanism that is virtually free in terms of incremental cost. That's something that an auto drive car can allow. But I just love the whole idea of going somewhere, having it drop off, and I have pre-programmed, because I'm a cheap guy, uh, to, for my car to go off and park it to find a $2 parking spot, which if you can go a couple of miles away, it's easy to do. And so you say, okay, I'm just going to have to plan ahead when I want to get picked up to uh, make sure that it comes back. And I hit the, my cell phone and it comes and picks me up right where I am. God, I love that. And now we can also get rid of mass transit. All we have to do now is kind of build some robust cars, and it's a really, really cheap taxi system, and it gets rid of the, the last mile problem. It's point to point. We've got all this capacity now because of the packing. You know, you, every lane of traffic now contains 20 times as much capacity. Some people say more. And mass transit is totally there. So we can rip up all the god-awful railroad tracks and things that people don't use and substitute an actual moving, breathing, wonderful thing and get the government out of our face, which is always a good idea. Anyway, uh, do you know what? Almost all of the cost of insurance is on fender benders. So I believe that the additional cost of instrumentation will be totally paid for by the drop in insurance costs that we'll have in drive. Anyway, I could go on and on, and often do. Okay, let me talk a little bit 
about Speed to Learn. Now, is that a cool logo or what? Double speed, school bus yellow, why not? Turns out that if it's fast and if it's fun, it's also very effective. And we have created a series of educational engines that can, in fact, uh, take almost any subject and induce the state of flow. And that state of flow teaches kids at about 10 times faster. We've been in front of uh, about 70,000 kids in about 1,500 classrooms. And we have some amazingly effective outcomes. We've been testing on um, Spanish vocabulary. And uh, these are the rules. These are the design rules. First one is active. You've got to be active all the time. Typical learning module says learn, learn, you know, lecture, 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 practice at homework, test on Friday. That is about as wrong as you can be. It's ineffective, it's wasteful, it's stupid. And that's what we're doing in school today. What if I were to tell you that you shouldn't, even though I'm lecturing, if you really wanted to learn what I had to say, this is really a bad way to do it. Our system is all tests. There's no lecture. There's no practice. There's nothing but play. And so you learn by doing. And you're going to make some mistakes. And, and we make it so that when you don't know something, we truncate your options. And you start guessing at things. And it turns out that guessing is almost as important as as knowing, because it starts creating this retention. And then you adapt. If you're missing a lot, things slow down. Things become less complex in your order. And pretty soon, you start getting it. Rapid response. We require a kid to respond about every three seconds. That seems like really fast. But what it does is says you've got all these data points. And the kid is engaged. We're getting feedback. We know what's happening. We make it harder. We make it softer. We make it faster. We make it slower. We make it less complex, more complex. And this continuous feedback maximizes interest. We get the kids into the state of flow. And we've done it over and over and over and over again. And all of a sudden, the kids, they don't know where the time's gone. They want to keep going. They're excited. They're happy. They've learned it. Good. That's good. Would it be bad? You know, I know that I can addict kids and people and adults to video games. Would it be so bad if they were addicted to learning? Atomic. It turns out that you want to have really fine-grained data and sequences and, and other things. And am I running out of time? We've got about maybe 10 minutes left. So oh, OK. And you want it to be self-tuning. You don't want to have to mess with it yourself. And so, Think of it as a little database, a little engine that's running in your browser, and a big engine running in the cloud. And so the cloud is, is, is making all these inferences and, and things like that, but the regular browser is, is really being tightened in there. Um, oh, everybody gets an A. Mastery-based is a very different thing. Everybody, in order to complete a module, has to get 100% on it. Not 20%, not 80%, not 85, 100. And it turns out that really changes the way kids think about something. And they know that they're not going to progress until they get 
And if they end up with not really understanding, if they understand everything but a little bit, it keeps working on that one little bit. It just keeps bashing you and bashing you until finally you get it. And so an interesting thing happens. What does grade mean? Does it mean trips around the sun? Third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade? Does it mean mastery? Everybody masters. And so grade as a concept in school goes away. You either master something or you don't. And it's not just pass-fail. It's mastery or no mastery. I've kind of already done this. What our business strategy is, it's a freemium model. Go in today, you can play in a uh, wordplay.com, write it down, go in and learn Spanish vocabulary faster than you ever have before. Uh, you will be able to speak Spanish at an elementary school level if you spend 15 minutes a day for the next two months. Think about it. That's nothing. So if you're not speaking for Spanish next time I come, there will be a test. <laughs> um, and we're going to crowdsource content. So our engine should be able to handle all kinds of atomized in information. So I want each of you to do something in chemistry, mathematics, history, geology, what have you. So I'm expecting a lot of help. Remember, this is a prequel. Fixing education is a prequel to fixing global hunger, hunger which is a prequel to fixing world peace. So I'm expecting as much help as possible. Anyway, um, word play vocabulary. These are just some silly little things that we're doing. And that's kind of all I got. We think that uh, we're going to do a thing called a hyper school one of these days, very shortly. We think that uh, a proper high school education includes a certain amount of computer programming, certain amount of economics, understanding about entrepreneurship, a lot of ex exercise. Did you know that if you exercise aggressively for 20 minutes, that is to get your heart rate up to 80 percent, that everything you learn for the next three hours, you're likely to remember twice as, mu twice as much because your brain secretes called BDNF. It's called brain-derived neurotropic factor. And it's like a precursor protein, miracle grow for your brain cells, creates dendrites, axons, what have you. So what you're actually doing by exercising, getting your brain all flooded with this BDNF, you're actually putting the concepts that you're learning into hardware instead of just new holographic pathways through your existing brain. The guys who discovered this think that it happened that when uh, Primitive man, when you got your heart rate up that fast for that long, you were probably being chased by a big angry critter or a tribe from the other, so other side. And that if you were able to exercise that hard and escape and remember how you did it, you were probably going to survive. Who knows? Anyway, thanks very much. Thank you. So, um, thank you very much. So, Time for a few questions. I'm going to go to the mics. The battery looks good on this one. Um, we did have one question from uh, from D the Dublin office. Um, can you give us some, some examples of these anti-aging games and, uh, and also say how they would work in different populations? So, for example, early childhood development or in disabled education, for example. Okay. The I have a company called Anti-Aging Games, which I've been doing some great stuff with, and. You know, you, you have to be careful to say that you are going to fix Alzheimer's or dementia or some of those things. 
But it turns out that a lot of the things that we're doing allow you to channel certain thought processes so that, uh, so that you can do some level of neurogenesis. It appears that as much as a third of our IQ can be manipulated by doing stuff. Different things are neurogenic. And so if you drive to work a different way every day and mix it up, you'll have a bigger brain than if you go the same way. Every time you, you have a habit or a repetitive action in your life, not neurogenic. Every time you do something weird, very neurogenic. Burning Man is neurogenic. A trip to Europe is neurogenic, the first time. Every time you do something for, and it turns out that if you can move your body at the same time, it's even more neurogenic. So for example, Tai Chi. Learning Tai Chi gives you a bigger brain, but only for about three months. If you continue Tai Chi after that, it's not nearly as neurogenic. You have to quit Tai Chi and start square dancing. And then after you, th you do three months of square dancing, you learn how to skateboard. And so if you, can if you can do these physical skills, you end up with a bigger brain. But there's a problem. You've got to get your, 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 your head massaged because you want to keep your bones in your cranium loose so that it can actually grow to contain this bigger brain that you're creating. I'm, I'm serious, this is, this, is, <laughs> this is real stuff. And it's, and, and you know, this is really good stuff because you can tell your wife or girlfriend that you, you need to, you know, increase your brain size and that she has to massage your head. <laughs> Not a bad thing anyway. Uh, but go into antiaginggames.com. Uh, it's primarily designed for people who are older, there are certain things that happen when you get old that um, causes you to like lose your car in a parking lot. Uh, you know, it's about ordered processes and thoughts, and, and, and I think you'll love it. Anyway, yeah. Thanks. Uh, yes. uh, when I grew up in Italy, for an, an embarrassingly, embarrassingly long time, I thought that Atari was a Japanese company. And so I was wondering if it was just me or if you picked the name on purpose to confuse people. It turns out that I was young and dumb. And I loved the game of Go, um, you know, the black and white stones on a 19 by 19 matrix. And when you attack someone and are about to steal their, their stones, you politely say, Atari. And I thought, that's a cool name. Had five letters, you know, starts with a vowel. And so I named it that. And I knew it was a Japanese word, but I didn't think that it was going to hurt us. And I don't think it, it didn't, you know. It wasn't, it was late enough that Japanese stuff is considered quality. But uh, it turns out that uh, Atari also means bullseye. When you hit the bullseye, also means jackpot. And, and it's fun because some of the Japanese that I've met with since they say, "Oh, Atari's very good, very good name. Perhaps a bit boastful for the Japanese." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I just actually wanted to. Uh, about the speed to learn kind of thing. So first off, the kind of what you're doing sounds a little bit like you know, how Rosetta Stone was trying, is trying to teach uh, language at the same time. So first off, I'd want to know a little bit about how your approach is different from theirs, if you're familiar. Mm -hmm. um, second off, uh, that kind of system of like the sort of trying, you know, factually testing yourself over various different things works great for things that are strictly factual, but for things that are more, you know, uh, like, construction or some creativity, that kind of thing becomes a little more difficult. Like computer programming is something where it would be a little more difficult. Sure, you could learn the syntax more easily, but in terms of becoming a better programmer, it may be more difficult to use that system for. So. Us against Rosetta Stone, we, we are very adaptive, and Rosetta Stone is not adaptive at all. Okay. Um, we are 
we're actually trying to do some data right now so that we can do match racing in terms of retention of various things between us and Rosetta Stone. I think we're five times faster once you look at working vocabulary. Uh, we're definitely ten times faster than a classroom. And a classroom with Rosetta Stone, we're definitely still at the ten times. We just haven't been able to, we know how fast. Our, our numbers are 1.4 minutes per word into a working vocabulary. Working vocabulary is, is different than mastery. It's where you can deal with all aspects of understanding a word and having the word come to you when you hear it. I don't know if you've ever constructed this question, you ask a Frenchman, and then you get the answer back and you have no clue what he said. So there's a difference between knowing the words and having them part of a working vocabulary. And we really focus on the working vocabulary. That's, that's kind of one thing. The, your second question is, you're exactly right. Atomized learning is about facts and data and stuff like that. We've got another program that we call sequences. And it's really about how you map things together in sets of, of knowledge. I believe that right now, we are going to be able, through alternative systems, hit about 80% of the high school curriculum. I think there's 20% that is just going to be the same as it's always been. You know, really hard. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, I think, I think uh, we had one more question approaching from the back. So um, I grew up in a city that had uh, showbiz pizza rather than Chuck E. Cheese's. Yeah. Um, can you tell, uh, tell us a little bit about that story? <laughs> How, yeah, I don't know. Well. Thumper, what did your mother tell you? If you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. <laughs> but. <laughs> A guy named Robert Brock fell in love with the idea of Chuck E. Cheese. And he came and asked for a large franchise area, pretty much in the Midwest, kind of Texas through, through Illinois. And, uh, and he, I don't know if it was malice forethought or what, but he went through all the training programs. He went through all the uh, programs. We designed his pizza parlor for him. Got everything all ready. The day he was going to open his first Chuck E. Cheese, for some strange reason, he didn't put the Chuck E. Cheese sign up. He put in Showbiz Pizza and bought some animals from a guy in Florida. Really pissed me off. We sued him won a judgment for $200 million that was to be paid over the next N years of, at the tune of 6% royalty, which was exactly what the franchise fee was. So we ended up being a franchisor without portfolio, without control, of showbiz pizza. And so everything was going along swimmingly and I got bored with Chuck E. Cheese for a bunch of reasons. See, I have five year ADD. I love what I'm doing for five years until things are really working well. <laughs> and then I find something else. As my wife says, some new bright shiny thing over here. And so uh, I turned it over to a group of guys and we ended up merging and selling the company to what turned out to be the holding company because Brock had sold his and it all came together. Big one happy family. The gorilla and those guys died and uh, we buried them and Chuck E. Cheese reigned supreme. <laughs> all right. As he should. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, Nolan, thank you very much for speaking with us today. It was an amazing presentation. Thank you. Thank you.